what is value? I'm going to talk about uh, what types of value there are uh, and I'm going to talk about why you would want to know the value of something in the first place, right? Uh, so that is the aim for today. Um, then next week and the week after I'm going to talk about methods to find those values. Uh, doing first the uh, reveal preferences uh, and then uh, in the week after uh, the stated preferences. <coughs> So at the end of uh, week six, you should know everything you need to know to do the essay that is to be, that is due in week nine, right? Um, so that is the plan, and that is why I put up the essay now. Uh, and I'm going to start actually not with the question of what types of values there are or how to value things, but I'm actually going to start with the history of value. The reason for that is. And actually the debate about what does this mean, what is value, has been going on for, as far as we know, uh, 2500 years or more. And it's apparently a, a very complicated thing because the cleverest people throughout history have debated how to actually do this and what this actually means. Um, and it is actually at the core, the theoretical core of every major school of economic thought uh, throughout history. Um, and the history goes back to um, Plato, uh, who you see here. Um, and the ancient Greeks were well aware of the notion of value and they made a distinction between value in use and value in exchange. And they couldn't quite figure out how the two related uh, to one another. Um, and uh, it was actually Plato who first raised uh, <coughs> the issue, uh, the, the, the seeming contradiction between the value of water and the value of diamonds. <coughs> and uh, he noticed, and other people around that time noticed, uh, that diamonds are very expensive even though they served no particular use. Which was true at that time, right? Now there's lots of industrial applications of diamonds, which is one of the hardest uh, materials uh, that we know of, and definitely the hardest material, uh, natural material uh, <coughs> that we are aware of. Uh, but at the time of Plato and um, other um, scholars writing around uh, that time, Diamonds were just for decoration, yet exceedingly expensive, right? Uh, whereas water was, at that time, free. If you were thirsty, you would just go to um, one of the streams that were still plentiful at that time in Greece, and you would just scoop up some water and drink it. And it was literally free. At the moment, we pay a little bit for our water, but still, it is fairly cheap. Um, <coughs> and I would not recommend that you go and drink water from the stream because it would make you terribly ill. Um, but at that time, water was practically free. Um, and whereas, regardless of what your girlfriend may say, people can live without diamonds, you can't live without water. You'd be dead in two days. And this greatly puzzled Plato and other ancient philosophers. It doesn't make any sense that a thing that is literally invaluable because you would be dead soon if you don't have it is the price of it is very low whereas the thing that you have no particular purpose for diamonds apart from decoration um, is so very expensive and they just could not get their heads around why this is <coughs> Uh, they, they realized that the price of things, um, and actually this went on for a very long time, like we started Aristotle, uh, then we have what I believe is Thomas Aquinas, uh, and go <coughs> all the way to the start of the Enlightenment. Um, people realized that the price on the market was essentially supply and demand, essentially the, 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 the price of something was whatever uh, any fool would pay for it. They, they did realize that. Um, but they 
could not quite understand it. Um, and they also weren't really interested in this. Uh, <coughs> because throughout ancient times, all the way up to um, the Enlightenment, or no, all the way up to the Neoclassical Revolution, people were not that much interested in the value of exchange. That was just some weird thing. The market was just not intrinsically uh, interesting. Uh, but they were very much interested in the value in use. And Aristotle, 2400 years ago, um, argued that the value in use is a moral thing. And that based on the principles of philosophy and based on the principle of ethics, you could derive its value. Um, <coughs> And it is essentially philosophy that sets uh, the intrinsic value of things. And that is how we should judge things and how we should evaluate uh, policies or other things that might be going on. Um, <coughs> now, those are the ancient, uh, ancient Greeks. Um, the, um, this particular thought was brought into Christian in the Christian mainstream by St. Augustine, uh, who you also uh, see here. Um, may confuse you, this is a very much a Greek uh, depiction, um, but his skin is fairly dark because he is a Berber, right? Uh, and he brought the Greek thinking into mainstream European thought, um, with a twist, of course, because the pagan Greek thought could not be just transposed to Christian thought, it had to be translated. And essentially what uh, Augustine said was not, it's not so much what philosophers think the value of something should be, it is what God thinks the value of something should be. Right? Now there isn't a much of a distinction there because in one case it's uh, old men who tell you what the value of something is, and in the other case, it is what old men tell you God's will is, what the value of something is, right? Um, so they just hide behind uh, 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 what they think is a sacred text. Um, but essentially, it derives from some sort of idea about what is good and what is bad, and that sets the value of things. <coughs> now, then we can zoom forward through all of the... Uh, um, Middle Ages, because essentially, if you then uh, the second or uh, the third big philosopher who wrote about value, Thomas Aquinas, um, <coughs> essentially just repeated what Augustine said in different words, right? So, throughout this period, throughout the Middle Ages, it was essentially still value is what God says value is, right? Or rather, what the priests and the bishops and the Pope says, God says, right? Because we don't know uh, what God thinks. We only know what <coughs> old men think God thinks, right? <coughs> uh, this changed a little bit initially um, in uh, the start of the modern period when uh, William, not Tom Petty, wrote that labor is the father and active principle of wealth as lands are the mother. So he actually moves to what we might recognize as the um, physiocrat and the classical value, uh, theory of value. Um, but um, Petty was way ahead of his time um, and the Casnay, the sort of the main physiocrat, said that value is the amount of land that is contained in something. And you may think this is different from what Augustine and Aquinas said, but it's not really, it's just a reinterpretation uh, of what he said. Because uh, the Casnay argued that things should be according to the natural order and the natural order is how God ordained things to be. But sort of like we have left uh, 
we have left the Middle Ages, we are sort of at the start of the Enlightenment, so you can no longer say we're just going to study the Bible and then we'll know, right? Um, um, Gesne was a little bit more empirical and said that God's will is expressed through nature, that's the natural order, and human society touches upon nature through agriculture. And God expresses his will and therefore the nature of what is good and what is bad through agriculture. And that implies that agriculture is the source of all value, land is the source of all value, and everything else, commerce, administration, those are just parasites on the value created in agriculture. And the value created by land. That was what uh, de Casne uh, argued. <coughs> um, and uh, you can sort of like see Galbraith here, right? Uh, Galbraith argued that most economic theories serve to maintain the status quo, serve the purpose of the elite. Uh, de Casne was landed gentry, he served in the court um, of uh, Louis XIV, right? So, <coughs> yes, he was very much a man of the elites. And his theory of land, or his, uh, his value, his land theory of value, I should say, very much served the nobility because they owned all the land, right? And essentially, what they argued is we own all the land, we are the only source of value. And this, of course, you can see as a reaction of the landed nobility against the upcoming merchant class, right? <coughs> um, Adam Smith picked up the other side of uh, William Petty's uh, statement and said, value derives not from the amount of land that is embedded in something in a product but it uh, amounts uh, it, it it is reflects the amount of labor that is embedded in a particular product <coughs> and here we see uh, his famous quote uh, on this um, <coughs> Smith was not the first one to do it but he was the first one to say this in Europe uh, earlier on even Khaldun uh, actually expressed this, but his work was written in Arabic and was not known to, um, to Smith, could not have been known to Smith. Um, Ricardo later refined the labor theory of value and Marx took it to uh, its theoretical uh, peak. Um, <coughs> and of course this has been tried particularly um, in the earlier times of the Soviet Union, right, where they tried to bring this uh, into practice with fairly disastrous uh, results. Um, but the crucial thing here is that according to the classical theory of value, it is labor that sets the intrinsic value of uh, stuff. And again, you could sort of like see this through the eyes of Galbraith, right, uh, because Adam Smith worked in the period of early industrialization in the United Kingdom and uh, Ricardo and Marx worked at later periods of early industrialization and at that time it was the merchant class and the industrial class that actually ruled the roost and this theory essentially served their purposes and essentially said well those old nobles with their land and their big houses they are probably not that crucial what matters is how much workers you actually have at your disposal that sets the theory of value and this also immediately sets England and Scotland against France, right? Uh, so you could interpret this theory as again serving the powerful. Um, <coughs> there's two um, other similar values. This is fairly recent. This is uh, 20th century. Um, where people say, well, the ultimate source of value is not the amount of land that goes into things or the amount of labor that goes into things, it's the amount of energy that goes into things. Um, and Jojesco Rogan, uh, Costanza and Odum are uh, <coughs> proponents of this. 
uh, this is died out uh, mostly nowadays people in ecological economics particularly um, essentially have gone back to the physiocratic land theory of value and I'll come back to this uh, in week um, 11 um, and they actually argue that really what matters is the absorptive capacity of the environment and that can all be measured in the amount of acreage uh, you have and you've probably heard of the uh, overshoot days perhaps not 2018 but the 2023 version or the 2024 version we are actually fairly close i think uh <coughs> the world overshoot day is coming soon um where essentially their argument is that we put so much pressure on the environment and we take so many resources out that we would need two or three earths to sustain the human population at its current consumption level which is again it's a measure about how big things are how much land you have um, and they say well this should override any other concern so essentially they're saying ultimately value is derived from the amount of land uh, there is <coughs> So to sum up, throughout history, for a very long period, um, value in use is set by some sort of absolute measure. That can be philosophy, that can be God, that can be land, labor, energy. But there is an absolute measure of value. <coughs> uh, the implication is that if the value in exchange, that is, the, if the price deviates from the value in use that is because there is something wrong with the market right the market is immoral in this particular view and we should intervene and correct things uh, as they're bought and sold because they're sold at the wrong price right uh, and some of these proposed interventions were more successful uh, than others uh, oftentimes it was just old men talking about these things but sometimes they had real consequences and I mentioned the example of uh, the early Soviet Union right <coughs> the classical economists of course fought the opposite right they also had an absolute theory uh, of value but they also thought that the market would actually lead to a Pareto optimum and they thought that the Pareto optimum was the optimum, right? Uh, so for the classical economists, most of them, um, the market was actually a good thing. It was a moral thing, not immoral, but moral, right? Uh, so keep that in mind as well. Now everything changed uh, around 1890 uh, with the neoclassical revolution <coughs> and here you see uh, the three uh, revolutionaries, I've put them up before, that's Jevons, uh, Menger and Walra. Um and essentially they, they did lots of things, lots of methodological uh, innovations but um, the crucial thing here is to Note that they realized that they could reconcile value in use and value in exchange. And essentially what they argued was that the marginal value in use is equal to the exchange value. So whereas previously people recognized that there was a value in use and a value in exchange and they did not know how the two related to each other, the neoclassical revolutionaries realized that you could find the value in exchange by looking at the value in use at the margin, right? Uh, and that is the neoclassical revolution. Uh, and as I said, it took people 2300 years to get there and they're still a great many people who are not trained in economics who do not understand this and there's also still a great number of economists who do not understand this um, but this is essentially how the two uh, reconcile and um, they also made another step 
And that is that their value in use, and they were only interested in it at the margin, their value in use was whatever economic agents thought the value in use should be. Uh, this is nowadays called uh, consumer sovereignty. That is, we take utility functions as given. It is not the job of an economist to say that your utility function is wrong. You should have different values. That is not our job. Our job is to measure people's utility, to study people's preferences, not to change people's preferences. Right? <coughs> and that is, of course, a great step away from what the philosophers did and what the, f uh, the, the priests uh, did, because they were about changing how you think about things. That is what philosophy and theology is about, right? To change your ways. As economists, since the neoclassical revolution, we accept people as they are, and we wonder what are the consequences of people being people, right? Not some idealized uh, version. Um, but um, <coughs> as they are. Well, of course, do assume perfect information and rationality, but that's a different story. Uh, the implication here is, of course, that the market is no longer immoral or moral. The market is the market. It's amoral, right? Not immoral, it's amoral. We don't have any judgment uh, about this. Uh, the implication of this is, of course, that values depend uh, on context, uh, supply and demand. They can depend on culture, custom, and taste. Um, I think that is best illustrated uh, with uh, an anecdote by Darius the Great, Shah and Shah, uh, who had collected a great many people uh, under his uh, empire. Uh, and noticed that these are very, very different people. Uh, and at one point he called uh, two tribes uh, into his court. And uh, for the Greeks, he asked, how much should I pay you? for you to eat your dead. And the Greeks were completely aghast <laughs> by this particular uh, suggestion and nothing could compensate them, nothing, no money would be enough for them to eat their dead uh, friends and relatives. Uh, then he turned to another tribe that was there at the same time, the Kalantians, who this is the Romanized name of a tribe in India, and asked them how much should I give you as compensation for you to uh, burn your dead? And they were completely aghast uh, by this particular solution because the proper way to honor your dead relatives is to eat them, right? Um, and this indicates that values differ between people. And uh, Darius just used this as an example of, yes, I <coughs> govern over a great diversity uh, of people. The Greeks uh, buried uh, their dead when at home and burned their dead when uh, on travel or in battle or something uh, like that. And other tribes, and actually the Clentians are, by f are not at all uncommon. There's lots of cultures where it's actually perfectly acceptable and actually the right thing to do to consume the dead, right? That's the way to honor them. Um, whereas most people in the room <laughs> think that's probably a very strange idea and no money in the world uh, would get me to eat grandma, right? Um, <coughs> but that is what we mean by consumer sovereignty, right? And if those are people's preferences, then those are people's preferences. Um, so values very de much, uh, depend very much on the context, um, also depends on uncertainty, when returns are uncertain we are willing to pay less, uh, when something is unique we are willing to pay more, whereas if you can just substitute it for something else then we care less about it, right? <coughs> So away with the sort of the absolute notion of value, right? It becomes something that is context dependent, no longer um, God's will or what some bearded philosopher may tell you value should be. 
Uh, these guys all have beards, right? Um, <laughs> uh, this guy doesn't. Um, uh, so how do we measure value? Um, the uh, standard micro will tell you there are two measures of value. Both uh, go back to uh, John Hicks, who you see here. I think he won the Nobel Prize in 1972, but it may have been 1971 or 1973, um, partly uh, for this work. Um, now, the, there's the two measures that are technically known as the Hicksian equivalent variation and the Hicksian uh, compensating variation, and sometimes you drop the word Hicksian, uh, but they're much easier to understand as the willingness to pay and the willingness <laughs> to accept compensation, because that is more intuitive. Um, so the willingness to pay is how much you are prepared to pay for something you do not have, right? Uh, and this is a supermarket scenario. You want to have a pint of milk and you wander into uh, the supermarket and you're going to buy a pint of milk. As a result, you have something that you did not have before, a pint of milk, uh, but you also have less money in your pocket, right? Or in your bank account. Um, <coughs> and the Hicksian equivalent variation, the willingness to pay, is the maximum amount you would, of money you would be given, you would be prepared to give up in order to acquire this particular product. Right? That is the willingness to pay. And it's a maximum, right? Um, the willingness to accept compensation is the minimum compensation you would be. Uh, you would demand if you lose something that you have. Uh, and the scenario here is that you just bought your pint of milk in the supermarket, you gave up money uh, to do so, now you walk out of the supermarket and you drop it all over the pavement, right? Somebody walked into you or something, or, or you were clumsy. Um, but if somebody walked into you, and as a result you drop your pint of milk, then you can morally demand compensation from the person who caused you to spill the milk, right? And the minimum amount of compensation that you would get that would leave you indifferent between having a pint of milk or receiving a sum of money is known as the Hicksian equivalent variation or the, uh, the Hicksian compensating variation or the willingness to accept compensation, right? So those are our two key measures of uh, value. Um, <coughs> and I'll come back to them uh, in two weeks. Um, now, <coughs> let's look a little bit closer at what is value and what sort of values do we actually have. Um, and uh, suppose you have this particular uh, forest with a nice stream in it. What sort of value does this actually generate for us humans, right? We're thoroughly in the humanist uh, utilitarian camp uh, at the moment. Um, there's two ways of doing this. The first one is popular uh, among uh, natural scientists, um, and that is to look at all the services that nature provides to us. Um, and they come in four broad groups. Uh, the first group are so-called provisioning services, and that is stuff that we take out of nature and consume. Uh, so that can be food, that can be water, that can be uh, wood f uh, and timber, um, and so on and so forth, right? That is stuff that we consume, uh, and that is something that nature provides. <coughs> um, there's also um, things that help us not directly, but things that help us indirectly, uh, and that would be uh, regulating uh, services. So the stream that you just saw 
can provide fish, uh, but it also transforms all sorts of contaminants that we have put in the water upstream. So it purifies uh, the water. Um, the uh, forest, uh, the trees that you saw, provide shade and keep parts of the planet relatively cool, right? And if you prefer that, there is another service that is uh, provided. Um, <coughs> the, if you have a swamp rather than a stream, then it also absorbs excess water during times of heavy rainfall and releases that water again during times of drought. Uh, so that is another service provided by uh, nature. Uh, you can think of pollination uh, and so on and so forth. Um, <coughs> and those things, even though they do not sort of like immediately, we do not really take things out of nature in order to enjoy it, uh, it really does help us in a great many ways. Um, there's other reasons, other services provided by nature, and they are typically called uh, cultural uh, services. Um, and that is such things as going out for a walk uh, in a forest, and you may enjoy that. Uh, so recreation, uh, ecotourism, uh, some people like to watch birds or other animals. Um, there are <coughs> spiritual and religious values that people attach to the fact that there is nature uh, out uh, there. There is aesthetic appeal uh, of these things and we appreciate all of that. Um, <coughs> so that is the third uh, group of uh, services. The uh, final one is uh, the sort of the underlying support for all of the above, right? Um, so such things as the formation of soils, um, that is the decomposition uh, of plant material, is important for everything that I just mentioned, but at one uh, remove or a little bit uh, further. Uh, so things as uh, <coughs> the production of oxygen uh, is fairly important for us and other animals um, and without nature that would not happen, right? Um, the uptake of CO2 <coughs> by uh, the terrestrial uh, biosphere by uh, plankton in the ocean is important for climate uh, regulation, right? <coughs> and actually, at the moment, nature removes around half of our CO2 emissions. So if you're worried about climate change, then you should be grateful for all these ecosystems that remove half of your emissions, because otherwise climate would change twice as fast, approximately. Um, and these supporting services, even though they're sort of invisible, right, and far away from anything we do, um, they're still terribly important, right? <coughs> so that is uh, one way to sort of say, well, these are the values provided by nature, uh, and these are the things we should take into account when trying to put a price on uh, changes in nature, right? <coughs> This is one way of looking at it, and it's very much from the perspective of what do ecosystems do for us, right? This uh, third classification of values takes it from a different angle, actually looks at it through our eyes. What do we care about? <coughs> and. Uh, the question here is what determines the total economic uh, value uh, and that comes in three broad groups, use values, option values and non-use values. Uh, each of it comes with its own subgroups. Um, use values come in direct and indirect use uh, and then direct come uh, as consumptive and extractive. Um, direct uses, 
um, option value split into option and quasi option and non-use values uh, split into uh, others use and pure existence. Um, now that doesn't mean a whole lot. Uh, okay, and then others use splits further into bequest and altruism. Uh, so let's look at the forest and see what are these different uses, right? Um, here we are. Um, so consumptive or extractive direct use would be you go into the forest, you chop them up for timber or for you chop up the trees for timber or for fuel wood uh, or you collect the nuts or the rubber or something like that, right? That is consumptive in the sense that once you chop down the tree it is gone uh, and you directly use the timber or the fuel wood, right? Um, <coughs> so I think it's pretty clear that this is a particular, this is of value to us, uh, us being humans. Um, there may also be non-consumptive use, right? In the sense that you just go out and enjoy yourself. Um, without harming the forest itself or changing the forest in a meaningful way, right? It's direct use in the sense that it immediately improves your welfare or your utility, but it's non-consumptive in the sense that you don't affect what generated this value in the first place. Um, indirect use are direct uses either consumptive or non-consumptive at one remove, right? Um, so that can be the storage of carbon. Trees are carbohydrates, so they store a lot of CO2. Well, they don't store the CO2, they store the C in the CO2, and the alternative would be that the C would be in the atmosphere as CO2, right? Uh, they regulate uh, water by uh, absorbing it in times of excess rain and slowly releasing it in times of drought. Uh, rainforests are also very good at protecting the soil. If you cut down the trees, then the topsoil just washes away uh, at the first uh, big uh, shower and you're not left with productive agricultural land, you're essentially left with something very akin to a desert, right? <coughs> uh, so rainforests are important in all those senses, but we don't use the soil directly, right? we use things that use that soil. So it's an indirect uh, use. <coughs> um, so those are the use values. Option values are use values, but potential ones rather than actual ones, right? So we have the option to use them uh, later. And that comes in two flavors. Uh, the option value proper is the prospect of developing ecotourism in a particular forest, right? Now, this is not an option in Costa Rica, which makes lots of money of ecotourism uh, in its rainforests, uh, but it is still an option in places like Guatemala, which also has rainforests but doesn't attract a lot of tourists. Uh, so there it is a clear option value. We know the tourists like this sort of stuff. We know the rainforest is there. We know that in principle we could attract a lot of uh, rich uh, people from England to go uh, look at these things, right? Uh, <coughs> it's a clear option. A quasi-option value is much harder to understand. Um, and that is that yes, there is a clear benefit but it is not known whether that benefit really exists. Um, and uh, one example is the discovery uh, of that antimalarial thing. Uh, I believe it's called quinine, uh, but it may be quinina. I'm not, not sure. Let's call it quinine. Um, that is made from the bark of a tree that was discovered, I believe, 130 years or so ago uh, in Peru. And it turned out that if you uh, distill this and use it as a, you take the bark, you use it as a tea, that actually helps against uh, malaria and other uh, types of uh, diseases. Now that is a direct use value <coughs> now, right? 
But it may be that in other parts of South America, in other parts of Peru, or perhaps uh, in uh, somewhere uh, in the rainforest in Southeast Asia, there is another tree whose bark stops AIDS or whose bark uh, cures uh, bowel cancer, right? We don't know. If that would be the case, that would be very, very valuable. We don't know whether such a tree exists. There's still many unknown species uh, lurking deep in uh, the rainforests uh, all over the world. Uh, if we were to cut down all these rainforests, then we would certainly lose this potential benefit, right? So that is a quasi-option value. If it would exist, it is extremely variable, uh, valuable, uh, but we don't know that it does exist, right? But still, the prospect that it might would give you pause before you uh, burn down or cut down uh, the potential source of this, right? <coughs> so there's a quasi-option value, and it is uh, sometimes very hard uh, to um, think what those might be if you're looking at a particular uh, example. But we're going to try uh, next week at the seminar, right? <coughs> um, now, let's look at the non-use values. Uh, they come in three flavors, bless you. Um, the first is not used by yourself, but used by others, uh, others that you care about. Uh, and there's two people you might care about. One uh, are so-called bequest values, that is the enjoyment of future people or of existing people in the future. Um, and uh, that is that you may want to preserve the rainforest because your children care about the rainforest. In my case, in your case, because your yet-to-be-born children might care about this, right? And that is a reason to preserve the rainforest, right? <coughs> uh, so that is uh, bequest values. Um, we also have altruistic uh, values. In which case, it's not a future other, but it is a current other that your friend might enjoy the rainforest and therefore you care as well because you care about your friend, right? That is another reason to say, I care about these things. <coughs> now, altruism is one of those weird things in economics that uh, everybody knows people are altruistic um, and uh, even hard-nosed economists who for a long time doubted uh, that altruism exists, uh, but now there is overwhelming evidence from experiments and surveys uh, that altruism does exist, that people really care about other people. Um, and of course, last week you guys played this public goods game and none of you acted like uh, homo economicus would, right? Well, very few of you acted like homo economicus would. And on average, we found uh, contributions to the public good that way, exceed, uh, way exceeds the sort of rational, selfish uh, approach. So that is strong suggestion uh, that altruism uh, does exist. Uh, so it's not just that, but by now there's also plenty of theory that shows that altruism must exist in order for human society to have evolved the way it does, right? Uh, there is no way we could have done what we have done if you were as selfish, say, as chimps are. That's actually one of the things that set humans apart from chimpanzees, that we're much more altruistic uh, than they are, and much less selfish uh, than they are. Uh, despite all these tons of evidence, this introspection would tell you that people care about other people, um, that despite tons of evidence that people are altruistic, still the core assumption in micro and in most of economics is that people are selfish, right? Um, which is a very peculiar thing. Uh, one of the reasons that this is maintained, as I said in the first week, uh, is that normative economics gets very hairy uh, once you introduce altruism into the motivation of people. It, it's a way of describing people's behavior, uh, but if you're adding up utilities and you introduce altruism, uh, then essentially you're going to double count people who have lots of friends, right? And um, 
ignore the things of people who are very unpopular and uh, the well-being of people who are very unpopular uh, so altruism has this very uh, <coughs> schizophrenic uh, relationship with uh, economics uh, and there's no good way around this um, <laughs> well there are ways around this but uh, none of them simple no, none of them are particularly attractive um, but definitely if we are talking about valuation and why people and that's what we're going to talk about next week and the week after why people say they are willing to pay for the preservation of something actually altruism is one of the explanations why they express a particular uh, value um, <coughs> now the thing uh, that is weirdest uh, perhaps um, in all this quasi option values are difficult uh, to get your head around sometimes um, pure existence um, value is another one that sits awkwardly uh, with standard economic theory and the words that uh, uh, George put up here actually explain why um, <coughs> so perhaps the study that brought out pure existence values clear most clearly uh, is a contingent valuation study I'm going to talk about it in, in two weeks uh, that people have done but essentially what you do in a contingent valuation study is you interview people you ask them how much are you willing to pay for something um, and in this case it was about bighorn sheep which are a type of sheep with very big horns uh, that live in the Rocky Mountains um, and people in Colorado and Montana were interviewed how much are you willing to pay to help preserve the bighorn sheep and that is a, a reasonable question uh, to ask and people uh, care about these animals because they sort of look great particularly from a distance because they are a bit scary from up close um, and they were willing to pay to help preserve this uh, species of animal right um, but then they also asked a question as follows now the best way to preserve bighorn sheep is to close off part of the Rocky Mountains and say no humans are allowed are you still willing to pay for this and the answer was yes I am right <clears throat> and then they took it a step further and said well it's not just that we're gonna close it off for regular visitors but we're also going to close off this area for park rangers, for biologists uh, and ecologists <coughs> starting the big horn uh, studying the bighorn sheep. Are you still willing to pay for this? And they said yes. And then said we're also going to shut off, uh, it was actually before there were drones, but they also suggested uh, we're going to close down all monitoring of this particular area but we've done our modeling and we're pretty sure that if we do this there's absolutely no human disturbance then the bighorn sheep would thrive in this area <coughs> and surprisingly people still said yes I am willing to pay to help preserve the bighorn sheep even if I cannot go and look at them from a distance even if no camera crews are allowed in this area and therefore I cannot see them on telly even if I just have to assume that they still exist and people are willing to pay for that and that is an existence value the fact that we attach value on essentially the thought of something being there and presumably thriving and being happy and do whatever sheep do right um, <coughs> and that is an existence value now, uh, George put up these uh, slides a long time ago, um, <laughs> and he makes a mistake here, right? Uh, because he says that existence value relates to stewardship, and a Christian concept uh, that we are put on, a uh, Muslim concept, uh, an Islamic uh, concept as well, 
that we're put on earth to take care of nature, right? That, that is our role as humans, and we've been appointed by God to uh, take care of uh, his creation. Um, that notion uh, may explain existence values, uh, or you may look at it from a moral philosophy perspective and say we have um, a certain duty as humans to protect other species or other species have certain rights. Uh, now that is not a value because a right is absolute and a value is always relative, right? So uh, this is actually a wrong uh, example here. Pure existence value means that you derive utility from the fact that something exists. Um, this is a good time uh, to break. After the break, uh, I'm going to talk about why you would actually put a value on something, what are the uses in policy analysis, uh, and then I'm going to talk about some applications of that use. I talked about value and what it is, and I talked about different kinds of value. Um, and uh, before next week, I'm going to talk about how to value, guys. Uh, I'm going to talk about why you would actually want to do this in the first place. I made a start of this uh, last week. Um, essentially, the answer uh, is all on this slide. Um, if you want to do a cost-benefit analysis, compare the impacts of environmental damage to the impacts of emission reduction, as I did last week, you somehow have to make them comparable. If you want to impose a PIGU tax, as I talked about uh, in week two, a tax is levied in money. So you would need to know how much something is worth in money. If you want to reward somebody for improving the environment, you need to pay them in money and you need to know what these environmental services delivered by them is uh, worth um, or if you want to extend the national accounts to reflect changes in the environment national accounts are measured in money so you need to do that <coughs> similarly if you do environmental damage and you want to pay compensation then typically the compensation is paid in money and in all those cases money is the appropriate uh, indicator. I put up this um, side by Robert Solo uh, before. Uh, this is what we unfortunately uh, have to do. Um, <coughs> so, we're gonna, first I'm gonna look at uh, cost-benefit analysis. Uh, and I talked about it last week. Um, and the important thing about social cost benefit analysis uh, as opposed to standard project appraisal is that you include the uh, costs and benefits uh, to everybody and you include all costs and benefits. So how would you uh, do that? Um, <coughs> and unfortunately there is no way around this. So let's consider uh, a, oh, I'm going too fast. Uh, let's consider two situations A and B and they're measured in a single dimension. Then it's pretty clear that A is greater than B, right? There's no doubt uh, about that because A is to the right uh, of B. Uh, A is greater uh, than B. If we think that more is better, say we are talking about chocolate, then it's pretty clear that A is not only more, but also better than B. Uh, if instead we are thinking uh, about uh, child labor, where we think that less is better, then it's pretty clear that B is better than A, right? So if we care about one thing only, then we can easily provided that we have the, uh, all the appropriate information, we can easily rank projects and situations. Now move to a situation where we care about two dimensions. <coughs> Let's assume that more is better in both dimensions, then it's pretty clear that A is uh, 
better than B because A is better in the X dimension and also better in the Y dimension. So regardless of how you priority one dimension over the other, A is better than B, right? Now, if we uh, consider situation C, say we return to um, <coughs> chocolate and child labor, then in a situation where there's more chocolate but, but also more child labor, you actually would not know whether more chocolate is better, because if chocolate comes also with more child labor, as it does, uh, then you don't know whether more chocolate is better or not. <coughs> now, the chocolate that I handed out yesterday is child labor free, right? Uh, so don't start shouting at me, but that is actually, uh, Tony Chocolonely is one of the few companies uh, that does this. Uh, if you buy Cadbury's or something else, it's a different story. And somehow you need to make this trade-off, and you don't know unless you make a particular transformation. Now, I don't know the trade-off between child labor and chocolate. Uh, I really don't know. Uh, but last week, we talked about badgers and cattle. And what we found is that the break-even point uh, was that one cow is worth 200 badgers. And therefore, you can translate everything well, actually, there was a break-even point, not necessarily the equivalent. But once you have this exchange rate, one cow is worth 200 badgers, you can put everything onto one dimension. You can project uh, <coughs> everything back onto the real line. And then you can say, well, A is better than B, or B is better than A. But unless, or C in this case, uh, but unless you make this transformation, you simply cannot say whether a situation is better than another if you have conflicting information on... Um, if one goes up and the other goes down, you simply cannot say, well, this is better than something else, right? And that is essentially what we do in a cost-benefit analysis. We take the x dimension as a numeraire, and then we transpose the A dimension, we multiply it with a particular factor that is essentially the exchange rate, and that tells you how many axes are in a Y, and then we express everything into X equivalents, uh, and that is uh, it, right? That is essentially what you do in a valuation study. Um, in the example I just gave, I expressed everything into badger equivalents. I measured the number of cows as how many badgers they would potentially replace, right? That is one way of doing it. Um, but typically we use money for this purpose. The numeraire is money. Why? Because of the reasons that I gave before, right? It's uh, Good tax is paid in money, compensation is paid in money. That is why it would actually be handy not to do it in better equivalents, but to do it in the equivalent uh, of uh, pound sterling. Um, <coughs> and the reason for this actually goes back to something that you undoubtedly recall from your principles. Money is defined as having three functions, right? Money is a medium of exchange. Money is a store of value, and money is a unit of account. And actually, we use valuation studies mostly with using money as a unit of account. It's not that we're trying to sell nature. It's not a medium of exchange. It's not that we store value. No, that's not what we're doing. We're just using it as a unit of account in project evaluation and appraisal. right? Uh, so that is why. And even if you say, well, I'm not going to do it in money, that doesn't take away that you have to somehow come up with the exchange rate between the things that you care about to express them into a coherent uh, and internally consistent whole, right? Um, <coughs> so that is the main reason why you would have to go to 
uh, money, right? <coughs> um, Those uh, cost-benefit uh, analyses I talked about can then be used to justify policy interventions, can be used to justify uh, regulation. Uh, if you are in the UK government or in the US government or in the EU government, uh, then you have to justify whatever decision you make by a cost-benefit analysis. Uh, not quite according uh, to standards uh, of cost-benefit analysis. Uh, but at least you have to have a paper that says cost-benefit analysis and put some numbers on. Um, and that is what you need to do. And oftentimes um, there are all sorts of uh, complex environmental issues uh, that you need to take uh, into account. Uh, for instance, if you're looking at quarrying, um, then uh, <coughs> you need to take into account the externalities of quarrying, that is the noise that is uh, generated, the dust, the vibrations, the water contamination, uh, the impacts on heritage and wildlife, the visual impacts, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh <coughs> so as I said, the UK government actually has a statutory obligation to do cost-benefit analysis whenever it uh, comes up with something um, <coughs> with a new regulation uh, and therefore the responsible department and this is an old one uh, so I think this is energy transport and the regions uh, but don't uh, quote me on that the, this department doesn't exist anymore um, did indeed commission evaluation studies to assess these externalities when they introduced a new, uh, in this case, a uh, levy, right? Uh, so they did this study and found that the willingness to accept compensation for removing sand and gravel from a nature reserve uh, came to nine uh, pounds per ton, a uh, willingness to pay. Um, to not do this uh, was two uh, pounds. Uh, and they went for the lower value and that is indeed the tax that companies pay if they quarry uh, and this presumably internalizes the externality and means that there's less quarrying in the UK uh, than there otherwise would be as I said this is an old study um, so I'm not sure whether it's a y the UK that does it or it's England and Wales, but uh, that is irrelevant for uh, the point. Um, <coughs> similarly, uh, the UK government has a tax on landfill. So you just dispose of your waste and then somebody comes and takes it away uh, once a week or every fortnight or something, uh, and then you don't worry about it. But uh <coughs> it does generate all sorts of uh, issues um, and uh, a lot of our waste is uh, landfilled it's essentially they dig a big hole in the ground and then they dump your waste uh, in it and they keep that up for two decades or so and then they put a lot of soil uh, on top of it and walk away that is essentially how landfilling works um, <coughs> and that creates all sorts of issues it uh, creates a lot of issues with local uh, congestion because you have all these heavy trucks uh, coming in uh, waste is smelly as you probably know and if you have a large amount of waste it is very smelly uh, and these things look uh, ter terribly ugly uh, and uh, there's a lot of organic material in your waste and that then degrades in an oxygen poor environment uh, and turns into methane which is a very powerful greenhouse gas uh, and there's also and you have all sorts of toxic materials uh, leaking into uh, the groundwater um, and so on and so forth it's really a very dirty uh, business so the government said well we're going to internalize those externalities and we're going to put a price on this so one of the reasons or one of the parts of the bill that you pay to dispose of your waste reflects the costs of this particular levy that is uh, uh, put on all uh, landfills in this uh, country. Uh, you can partly uh, blame me because the price that is put on greenhouse gases 
is from a study that I did a long time ago and I haven't updated. Um, <coughs> similarly, um, if you fly uh, for holiday or to visit family uh, or uh, whatever, you pay an air passenger duty, right? And that air passenger duty that you pay at least in theory, reflects the damage done by the CO2 that is emitted by your flight, right? So really, this is uh, <coughs> used a lot. Um, there is something wrong with the order of my slides, I realize, right? <laughs> Uh, so there's other applications uh, of monetary valuation. I gave you a couple already. I don't know why I gave them before I announced that I would do so. Um, and that is, uh, you can use them in uh, compensation. Uh, so what you're looking at here is the uh, accident on the deep water horizon. Uh, this was in 2010, uh, a long time ago by now, 20 April. Uh, of 2010, <coughs> there was this huge explosion on this oil platform uh, that sits off the coast uh, of Louisiana in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, and this was owned and operated by uh, a company that at that time pretended that its name was Beyond Petroleum, but really they were British Petroleum. Um, <coughs> and um, it's an interesting trade off uh, that the company made. Um, at that time, British Petroleum advertised itself as beyond petroleum. They were one of the, well, the only oil major that heavily invested in renewables at the time. And they were the darling of the environmental movement uh, because they were investing in renewables and they were moving beyond uh, petroleum. Also by ditching the British name, they sort of like ditched the colonial um, <coughs> Um, history uh, of the company that of course started in what is now uh, Iran um, but uh, <coughs> British uh, <laughs> or beyond petroleum invested all this money in renewables said it was going to leave fossil fuels altogether and was just as profitable if not more than Royal Dutch Shell or Exxon Mobil, Exxon Mobil didn't exist at the time, Exxon uh, and Chevron and all those other uh, big oil companies. And they were really the darling of the environmental movement. Um, but it turns out that the reason that they kept their profits up, despite heavy investments in what was at that time not a profitable activity, namely renewables, uh, was from cutting costs on health and safety. Uh, and the result was, uh, one of the results of that was uh, this particular explosion uh, that you uh, see here. Um, and it was not just that uh, a bunch of workers on the platform were killed. Uh, <coughs> also, basically all uh, stuff, uh, all machinery on the platform was damaged, as you can imagine. And this was one of those oil wells that you <coughs> dig the well and then the oil comes gushing out so if you remove the sort of the equipment to take the oil and put it in an oil tanker and take it for a refinery <laughs> the oil keep comes gushing out and they uh, spilled some 60 750 million liters of oil uh, in the Gulf of Mexico as a result. Thank you, John uh, Brown. Uh, as a way of thank you, he was put in the House of Lords, as you can uh, imagine. Um, <coughs> now, all that oil, of course, uh, created uh, lots of damage, uh, lots of dead birds. Um, uh, tourism industry uh, in Louisiana and uh, adjacent states uh, completely collapsed because the, the beaches were covered in oil uh, and so on and so forth. Enormous damage. Fisheries uh, got into uh, deep, deep trouble uh, because the boats couldn't go out and so on and so forth. Um, <coughs> um, and the question is, of course, can you prevent this by sort of, you guys haven't done the economics of crime yet, right? That is next term. Um, 
One way of making sure that these things don't happen is to slap fines if it does, right? And that sort of, sort of should then act as a uh, deterrent. Um, <coughs> Uh, and that is exactly uh, what was done. People tried to put uh, money uh, on this, and big court cases, uh, and in the end they had to pay billions and billions <coughs> in fines for essentially, I, I wouldn't call it negligence, it was way beyond uh, negligence what, uh, um <coughs> what, uh, British Petroleum did here. Um, <coughs> I hesitate because I obviously prepared the first half. Uh, <laughs> now wondering what is, and this is still uh, very much uh, George's lecture. What is he gonna do um, <coughs> now? Right. Um <coughs> So you can pay for the damage uh, afterwards. Uh, you could also try and say stop uh, deforestation. Um, and the reason that people cut down and burn down forests is because a forest to them has no value. But if you clear the land and put on cattle, then it does generate money, right? So, uh, <coughs> one way to stop them from clearing the forest uh, is to say you're not allowed to do this. And many countries with extensive forests uh, indeed have legislation on the books that it's not allowed to log uh, or to clear uh, forests. Um, the problem with that approach is <coughs> You need to monitor, mm -hmm. you need to enforce, you need to prosecute, uh, and so on and so forth. All of that is costly. Um, definitely, if you're talking about, say, the rainforest in Brazil, it is enormously large, and actually keeping an eye on the forest is expensive. So just the monitoring, seeing what is going on, is actually very, very difficult. Uh, then going into what used to be a rainforest and tell uh, people with uh, big bulldozers uh, that they should not be doing this and there's many wild animals so they don't just have bulldozers but they also are typically armed uh, then to go in there and say you guys have been naughty and I'm going to put you in jail or I'm going to fine you may not be the safest thing to do right and we've seen uh, <coughs> lots of violence in uh, these places because essentially they're almost beyond the control of the state um, <coughs> so that is that approach has not been proven very effective um, um, and instead what you could do and what is increasingly done is that you offer an alternative, an alternative that is just as valuable to the people who do this and create uh, in some way or another uh, a source of income that depends on the trees being there. And returning to uh, Brazil, uh, <coughs> that is indeed what the Brazilian government at the moment is doing, uh, or at least it did so under the first Lula government. And I'm think it does again on the current one not sure whether the guy in the middle uh, did <coughs> but essentially farmers are being paid if they can demonstrate that the forest that was there last year still stands on what is their land right uh, similarly uh, farmers in England are being paid <coughs> if they keep their hedges in good order not because we like the hedges per se uh, but because the hedges are breeding uh, <coughs> are nesting uh, areas for the birds are habitat for lots of useful uh, insects and so on and so forth so 
to the farmer these hedges are actually a nuisance because you can't just drive your tractor over it and it would be much easier if you just clear all the hedges uh, on your own land the hedges between you and your neighbor do serve a purpose saying well this is my land and that is yours uh, but farmers are getting ever ever bigger uh, in this country and really what you would want on your own farm is get rid of all the hedges because they just take up space uh, and uh, get in the way uh, of things and in order to prevent farmers from doing so <coughs> we actually pay them for the linear extent of hedges on their farm um, <coughs> and that is a way of uh, preventing <coughs> now the uk england is of course much more densely populated so we have an army of volunteers to actually monitor uh, those hedges um, <coughs> much easier than the brazilian uh, rainforest um, <coughs> Fines and damages, I talked a little bit about uh, the Deepwater uh, Horizon. This is the Exxon Valdez, um, which happened way before you were born. I think this was, uh, oh, it actually does say so, but you can't read it because it's uh, black on uh, deep, deep purple. Uh, it was 1989, <coughs> so <laughs> your dad hadn't even met your mother yet, um, <coughs> presumably. Um, <coughs> this is um, Exxon was Exxon then, not Exxon Mobile. Uh, the Valdez was one of their tankers. Uh, it ran aground in the Prince William Sound, which is uh, in Alaska, in uh, 1989. And <coughs> this was the largest oil spill in uh, history. Uh, at that time, 40 million uh, liters of crude oil, um, 200 kilometers of shoreline uh, was contaminated, a quarter of a million seabirds uh, were killed, and lots of otters and seals, and uh, lots and lots of other uh, deaths uh, occurred. Um, this did not lead to the government saying, we're gonna fine you, as happened to a certain degree in, um, with regard to the Deepwater uh, Horizon, this was essentially solved in the courts. So the people who were negatively affected by this, uh, primarily fisher people in, um, in Alaska, as well as the state itself, on behalf of the otters and seals and birds and everything, um, <coughs> essentially took Exxon to court and said, you did this damage, we want compensation. Uh, this was an enormously big, complicated um, and bitter uh, fight. Uh, <laughs> if you meet an elderly environmental economist from the US and you say Exxon Valdez, you get a long, long story uh, about what they did uh, and why the other party uh, are evil. Um, <coughs> But essentially, they, what the court ordered <coughs> and what the litigants uh, did was an environmental valuation study and said, well, this is the willingness to pay or rather the willingness to accept compensation uh, of people for a pristine uh, Alaska. And uh, at the end of the day, uh, or th they came up with an estimate varying between three and nine billion US dollars. That's a fairly uh, sizable sum. Uh, and the courts, awarded something like this in the punitive damages on uh, ExxonMobil for uh, essentially negligence. Uh, I mean, this, this, this was one of those things that, yeah, the, the, the captain was at fault and the company should have uh, done better, but of course they did not do it on purpose because, I mean, oil is valuable, right? <coughs> uh, so that was one of the outcomes of this. The other outcome is that the particular ship that was used for oil transport is now uh, outlawed. Um, <coughs> so yes, these valuation studies are really, really uh, used. Um, I talked about this, right? Sometimes you just want to um, pay people not to do things that comes uh, as payment for environmental services. Um, I talked about this. Um, 
essentially what you want to do here is make sure that whoever controls this part of nature does not um, has a good reason not to damage it because the alternative of a pristine uh, or a maintained type of nature is in their uh, own uh, interest. Um, <coughs> I'll talk about Coase in a couple of weeks time. Um, this is just another example. Um, so uh, <coughs> what we're currently doing, we including you, um, is that the government of this country, uh, you guys don't pay tax, right? Uh, but it does come out of the opportunity cost because, it, because they could have used this to subsidize uh, universities instead or at least lower the interest uh, on your student loan, uh, which they haven't done. Um, <coughs> so you pay for this as well. Uh, essentially, there's oil in uh, a particular watershed, uh, the Piram Piro uh, in Ecuador. Um, and they would really like to get this oil out, uh, but the UK government uh, and a bunch of film stars said, no, we don't want you to do it. And instead, we are just going to pay you to leave the oil where it is. This is partly good for the climate, right? Uh, less oil to burn. Uh, and it's partly to preserve the rainforest and the watershed from the environmental damage that is done when you go drilling for oil uh, and then the, all the oil spills that come with it and the heavy tra traffic and everything uh, that come with it. So yeah, this really um, works uh, in uh, practice. <coughs> there is an issue here uh, and this is uh, almost the last slide. Um, and that is of course, what sort of rents do people extract from this. So in the example of Ecuador, it's a, it's a fairly weak government uh, and they were happy just to take the money because they weren't sure whether they could do uh, the drilling in a good place, in, 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 in a solid way, yes uh, or no. Um, but in other cases, you actually may say, I have this piece of nature that you Europeans really, really like. I'm gonna damage it unless you compensate me for not doing it. Uh, so it is a bit uh, scary there. And governments, some governments are certainly not beyond this. Uh, in other cases, it's not so much the governments that are not beyond this, but it is uh, <coughs> private actors uh, in not so well-regulated countries uh, <coughs> that do this, or in well-regulated countries. The example that comes to my mind uh, at the moment uh, is this scheme that used to be used uh, in uh, climate policy. Uh, <coughs> so there's all sorts of greenhouse gases. You know about carbon dioxide, and I just mentioned methane. Uh, there's also this thing called uh, chloro, no, hydrofluorocarbons, HFCs, which are an extremely powerful greenhouse gas. <coughs> um, but the industrial value of these gases is actually pretty low because anybody with a degree in chemical engineering knows how to make these things. Uh, and building a factory that makes HFCs is actually a fairly cheap thing to do. Uh, so the market is oversupplied, the industrial value uh, is pretty low, but because it is such a powerful greenhouse gas, its effect on the climate is actually pretty high. So what some jokers um, in uh, China did was they built a factory to make HFCs, and then they said, we're gonna release these HFCs into the atmosphere unless you pay us the climate price for these things. Uh, and Europeans happily paid up and said, no, 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 please don't uh, open this factory. So what they did was they uh, did not open the factory. They took out all the machinery, put it in another factory and said, we're gonna <laughs> release this HFCs uh, into the atmosphere unless you pay it. They, they got fairly uh, rich as a result. So you, you can abuse these sort of uh, schemes uh, as well. Uh, the final thing uh, that I want to say, and I'm going to be uh, uh, finished ahead of time, um, 
and we're going to get back to this in the final week, is that you want to extend the national accounts to include uh, the value and the damage done uh, to the value of nature and the damage done uh, to the environment. Um, and the reason for that is very simple. <coughs> Politicians, journalists, the general public, all think that economic growth is terribly important and definitely for people uh, who are uh, on the lower ranks of the income distribution it is terribly important um, <coughs> but it would be uh, sad if economic growth comes at the expense of the environment if what you think is economic growth is only because the things that we measure grow whereas the things that are just as important but we don't measure if those shrink right then actually the growth is an illusion rather than real um, and one of the purposes of environmental valuation is to correct the record of growth to include the damage that we do to the environment um, <coughs> And uh, that is actually something that I'm going to get back to in the final lecture. So this is a good place to stop. <laughs>